from our country's founding, we've been dedicated to protecting the freedom of our citizens' rights to worship. No one in America should feel afraid to follow the religion of their choosing freely and openly. The President is dedicated to preserving this originating principle of our nation. Welcome back. That was White House spokesman Sean Spicer addressing the recent wave of anti-Semitic violence. Is the administration doing enough to stop hate crimes? Let's get back to our panel right now. Arjun, I want to come to you in a minute, but first I want to get your response to what Sean Spicer was saying. There. That last part of the, what he said there was, the president is dedicated to preserving this originating principle of our nation. Well, uh, How much credibility can we attach to that? <laughs> it, it is a uh, very um, uh, interesting uh, comment, and I think at this time we have uh, to mobilize all the efforts together, uh, to stand together, to show that the solidarity among uh, religious uh, minorities in, uh, in the country, and uh, as well as uh, looking into addressing these issues uh, publicly and more wider than, than what it is right now. Yeah, because it seems the words are there, Arjun, but there are also other words, like I'm going to ban all Muslims from coming into this country, which doesn't gel with that at all. Uh, talking about how this will be combated, um, what do you make of law enforcement efforts to combat this? I mean, you did point out that a lot of it's not reported, but what else is being done? So I think hate crime reporting should be mandatory, not voluntary. Um, I think education is important, certainly interfaith work is important, but we also need to recognize there is a $57 million Islamophobia industry in this country that demonizes Islam, that vilifies Muslims, and the reports and news that they put out stigmatizes Muslims, and it leads to hate hate speech and hate violence. So really tackling that industry. Thinking even about the media, when was the last time you turned on the television and saw a Muslim or Arab character who was a protagonist, who wasn't a terrorist, right? Um, and then finally, really getting back to this point of criminalization. I think trying to stop hate violence when the government continues to discriminate against people who look differently is futile. I think we really have to hold the Trump administration and law enforcement to account when they decide to treat our communities differently. Those are serious and interesting points that you bring up there. In fact, there was a, a senior researcher at Georgetown University, Nathan Lean, who wrote a book called The Islamophobia Industry. And he pointed out that Islamophobia is driven by a group of right-wing intellectual hucksters, I'm quoting here, bloggers, pundits, and politicians who've attempted to demonize Islam, and they have succeeded in part because fear sells. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is a, I, it's painful to admit it, but this is a thriving industry. Uh, they encourage policies of criminalization, like suspicious activity reporting, bans, watch lists. They work with state legislatures across the country to pass anti-Sharia laws. They try to stop mosques from being built uh, by manipulating zoning ordinances. Um, they encourage um, uh, uh, hate mongering in open carry states. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a situation last year where there were protests across the country in front of mosques in open carry states. And Muslim youth had to walk by individuals carrying guns, yelling death to Islam on their way to mosque, right? That cannot happen in the United States of America, period. Sina, what about the point that Arjun talks about <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is uh, American popular culture that also demonizes Islam, that we see Muslims playing only one kind of character on movies or this is, on uh, television. This is very uh, interesting. What uh, Rajanda just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's very interesting, especially uh, the industry that it's feeding into it. But at the same time, we have to look on the other side as well. The, um, the videos and the, uh, all these uh, crimes that uh, groups such as ISIS or Qaeda, they put on there on social media and on TV, contributes a lot to that fear. In the, in the public arena, as well as here in America and Europe and all around the world. So yes, there is that uh, Islamophobia, probably industry that we, we just talked about. But at the same time, there is a, a, something that's feeding into it from the uh, Muslim, radical Islamists and Muslims, uh, uh, radicals themselves into, uh, into that. So this is make it very hard to, uh, to juggle. It's not only one side. It's actually from uh, coming from uh, from uh, different uh, other areas as well. And Sean, uh, 
Do you think the criminal justice system is prosecuting those responsible for hate crimes? There was a very interesting figure that I came across. It was published by Mother Jones magazine, which said that between January 2010 and August 2015, federal prosecutors pressed forward with only 13% of hate crimes that were referred to them. Well, I'm not familiar with those particular numbers. Um, and it is very difficult to determine what, when something, a crime is actually a hate crime right. in some instances. So that may be what's responsible for those numbers. Uh, but frankly, look, we've had six waves of bomb threats against the JCCs and other Jewish institutions. And we've, uh, so far, law enforcement has really only been able to locate, uh, I think, one of the, the perpetrators of, the, of, of those calls. Uh, so the Jewish community is certainly uh, very uh, looking forward to, 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 to them getting up on that. Right. Arjun, this 13% that I was referring to, these are, of course, people who went before a jury. But there's also, and you as a lawyer would know this, there's also this other phenomenon in the United States called plea bargaining, where people don't even go to trial. It's all sorted out uh, before they go to trial. So um, the fact that only 13% goes to trial? Um, so there are a few things happening yeah. there. Um, in some cases, in most cases, there are states that have their own hate crime laws. So in some cases, states bring hate crime charges under their own laws, specifically with respect to the federal statute. Uh, one of the issues that we have run into is that courts are requiring prosecutors to show that hate was the sole motivating factor. So for example, if I'm targeted because I'm a sick American, but also because somebody disagrees with, for example, my political views, that would not be a hate crime because hate on the basis of my personal identity was only one factor among two that led to the act. So that's part of the problem. And I do think uh, we need a new federal statute that clarifies that particular issue, namely that so long as hate is a meaningful contributing factor, mm -hmm. that should be sufficient. I would also say, at least from my perspective, I believe in hate crime charges not because I want to add 10 years to an already lengthy 40-year jail sentence. Um, I believe in hate crime charges because hate crimes are unique. The definition of a hate crime is a crime that would not have occurred absent the victim's identity. And a hate crime prosecution sends a message to the entire impacted community, the government has your back. Um, so I do believe we need to be thinking about um, how to better enforce hate crime laws, but also think about the restoration and the healing that has to happen after hate crime. So when you think about Kent, Washington, when you think about you know, what happened in Kansas, it's not enough to bring hate crime charges. We need town halls where community members can come right. forward and actually talk about how this has impacted them collectively. And speaking of that, Zainab, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier on that uh, your organization, the mm -hmm. American Islamic Congress, is involved in these interfaith uh, programs. What else are you doing? Uh, we do the uh, as uh, we do uh, town hall meetings with the uh, community and law enforcement, the FBI, DHS, and many other members of, of the uh, law enforcement uh, community, and open that conversation because we have a lot of youth in a very critical age, right. and these youth, they are most of them are. Uh, the, the internet is open and might be recruited by radical groups and so on. There are few that have been lost into okay. that road, unfortunately. So this is to ease and make families feel secure and safe to protect their children at the same time, open that back and forth conversation between the law enforcement and community wow. members to protect the communities. Right. Well. We got to go. Unfortunately, time has uh, caught up with us. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's all we have time for today.